This video was brought to you by Atlas VPN. Hello, all you happy people. You know what? I'm the hero. Droopy is the impassive, lethargic basset hound created by the legendary Tex Avery in the middle 40s. One of the most important characters spawning from one of the most groundbreaking series in animation history, Droopy has somehow gone down as a forgotten, underrated and underused gem, appearing in vastly lesser roles over time. In 2023, Droopy celebrates 80 years and to help him I'll trace his entire evolution from 1940 to now. I'll look at the character's history, touching on his various changes over eight decades of shorts, series, specials and movies in this edition of Cartoon Evolution. <laughs> After several years at some of Hollywood's biggest animation houses, animator Fred Tex Avery arrived at the Schlesinger studio in 1935, where a crew of rowdy upstarts were about to pave new ground making cartoon comedies for Warner Brothers. In a way that wouldn't be out of character for one of his cartoon creations, Avery weaseled his way into the studio, convincing studio head Leon Schlesinger that he had been a successful director at the Walter Lance studio. Of of course, it was an elaborate ruse, with Avery later saying, I was no more a director than nothing, but with my loud mouth, I talked him into it. Hired as the infant studio's third ever director, Avery was afforded his very own unit and building. With the structure Schlesinger had on the Warner backlot no longer able to contain his increasing number of staff, the five room bungalow at the back of the lot given to Avery's unit would affectionately become known as Termite Terrace, a nickname which in later years would become associated with the Warner cartoon studio in general. At Warner's, Avery had a huge hand in shaping the iconic, wacky nature of the Looney Tunes, introducing fast sight gags, exaggerated slapstick comedy, and an overall frenetic nature. Throughout his brief but legendary time at Warner's, Avery both introduced and helped refine a string of insanely popular madcap characters, who changed cartoons forever. In mid-1941, amid boiling tensions, a row erupted over Schlesinger's aggressive desire to try a section from one of Avery's recently completed Bugs Bunny cartoons. Avery stormed out and was slapped with a four week unpaid suspension from which he never returned. As one of the most creative animators of the time, only two months later Avery signed a five year contract with MGM Cartoon Studio as director, forming a new unit to run alongside the insanely successful unit headed by William Hanna and Joe Barbera. Under Schlesinger, Avery said he'd felt stifled, never given the freedom to experiment or express himself in the way he desired. But under Fred Quimby at MGM, Avery now had more space to get creative, finding even the little things refreshing and liberating. He said, MGM is a heck of a better place to work in every way. Animation historian Leonard Moulton wrote, While his work at Schlesinger's was fresh and innovative, he really blossomed at MGM, where he developed his ideas to outlandish extremes. Avery knew how to make the most of the cartoon medium. He had no interest in duplicating or imitating reality. In his mind, the broader, the more unreal, the better. And you need look no further than his first MGM cartoons to see this unbridled energy at play. Avery animator Michael La noted, when Tex moved in, it was like an avalanche hit. While his cartoons were overshadowed by the commercial success and critical acclaim of Hanna-Barbera's Tom and Jerry cartoons, Avery's uninhibited style was possibly the most revolutionary to come out of the studio. His style not only became synonymous with MGM cartoons, but went on to define THE animated cartoon. Eight decades on, when one thinks of cartoons, they think of iconography Avery established, with Moulton saying he, perhaps more than any other single person in animation perfected the art of the gag cartoon. In rapid succession, Avery pumped out an array of chaotic cartoons, swiftly introducing a roster of characters that eventually became mainstays of his films, including the sultry and seductive Red, the, um, excitable Wolf, 
and the eccentric Screwy Squirrel. The only thing Avery truly missed about the Warner Studio was working with the Looney Tunes, so he quickly established a Toon roster of his own, building it essentially within his first year. Feeling a little glum that all the best animation is locked behind international streaming services? Finding that your local services don't offer the greatest selection? Right now, Atlas VPN is offering a big deal, with a three-year premium subscription available at a special offer of just $1.83 per month. Plus, you'll get three months extra. Developed by top cybersecurity specialists and IT engineers, Atlas VPN was created to make the internet accessible and secure cure for everyone. Atlas VPN easily connects to over 750 high-speed servers around the globe, allowing quick, secure and efficient access to all the great streaming services, allowing you to fully explore the vast selection of region-specific content available worldwide. So be quick and grab Atlas VPN Premium at the limited time special offer of just $1.83 per month, plus three months extra, and with a 30-day money-back guarantee. Get many benefits of Atlas VPN while protecting your privacy for this ridiculously low price. You can take up this deal by clicking the link in the video description. Avery's most different, yet easily most beloved creation was built from a totally different mould. He wasn't wacky, zany or quick. He was a glum, laconic, lethargic, jowly basset hound aptly named Droopy. Of course, like many cartoon classics, in his first appearance, Avery's third cartoon for MGM, 1943's Dumb Hounded, Droopy didn't debut with his name on screen. However, from the outset, Avery had christened him, with the name appearing on his earliest character models. Dumb Hounded pitted Droopy against the wolf, who'd become one of his many rotating antagonists, and was actually the cartoon's intended headliner. Here, the wolf escapes from prison, but is thwarted by by Droopy, who magically appears no matter where he flees. Animation historian Michael Barrier astutely compares Droopy to God, saying he is everywhere or exists in uncountable multiples of himself, an idea no less crazy. Droopy's dry personality and sardonic one-liners drive the wall further and further under pressure and into madness, causing him to make dumb mistakes that are eventually his undoing. Naturally, this cartoon caused a stir, leading to more Droopy installments, though he wouldn't officially be named on screen until his fifth, 1949's Senor Droopy. Dumb Hound had naturally provided the foundation for the formula of Avery's ensuing Droopy cartoons, in which the Hound outwits and outplays his arrogant and brash enemies with little to no effort. Sardonic, sarcastic and passive-aggressive, Droopy can annoy, anger and overwhelm victims with just a few laconic, jowly words or movements. The rivalries become somewhat one-sided, with Droopy driving them so far into frustration that they unwillingly self-sabotage and self-annihilate. Droopy often celebrates with his classic stone-faced catchphrase, You know what? I'm happy. He is perhaps the luckiest little scamp in all of animation and easily the most apathetic hero to grace the screen. It's been suggested that Droopy evolved from an earlier Avery character, Cecil Turtle, who debuted in 1941's Bugs Bunny, Tortoise Beats Hair. Droopy shared Cecil's nonchalant nature and his ability to aggravate an opponent by effortlessly keeping one step ahead of them. More notably though, Avery was inspired to craft Droopy after Wallace Wimple, a character on radio serial Fibber McGee and Molly, voiced by comedic actor Bill Thompson, who was even coaxed over to MGM to voice Droopy. Avery took the character, voice and all, and essentially turned him into a cartoon hound. Oh no, thank you, Mrs. McGee. I find that tea stimulates me too much. 
he would later admit that Droopy was built on a voice, admitting it was a steal, there ain't no doubt about it. Soon enough, Droopy's rogues gallery grew to not only include one-off opponents, but repeat offenders, such as another wolf known as Southern Wolf, a hapless character who'd go on to star in one of his own cartoons and would later be used as the basis for Hanna-Barbera's Huckleberry Hound, and dim-witted bulldog Spike, later renamed Butch to avoid confusion with the character of the same name and species from the Tom and Jerry's. Droopy was never bound to any particular time or place, jumping across settings and continents and spanning dozens of timelines and historic eras, taking on various roles and jobs. Like all the cartoon greats, he was an actor, playing whatever character the films called for. Droopy's visual evolution was slow but noticeable, becoming cuter over time. In his first two cartoons, he appeared with cream-coloured jowls while they were white in every other. Into the 1950s, the jowls were made less prominent and in Avery's final cartoons, they seemingly disappeared altogether. Likewise, in the later tunes, Droopy's muzzle switched from a cream colour to white. Some of his later appearances saw him in a stylized angular design, while others even saw his coat change from white to light grey. The cartoons also saw a drastic stylistic evolution, comedic timing became more refined and pace gradually more rapid as Avery fine-tuned his ability to tell increasingly more chaotic stories with crazier, more violent rapid-fire gags. Barrier cites Droopy's fourth cartoon, 1946's Northwest Hounded Police, as a great example of how the Droopy's and Avery's cartoons in general changed in such a short amount of time. The cartoon, which has essentially the same premise as Dumbhounded, is notably much, much faster and strikingly more hectic. His cartoons became so frenzied, they bewildered and disoriented studio executives, audiences and even other animators. Avery continued to break the conventions of cinema, shattering what few actually remained in the cartoon medium. Moulton said that he was not content to stretch reality for comic effect. He turns it inside out, upside down and into a fourth dimension that leaves one breathless. Cranking out as many as seven shorts a year between his various series and one-shots, by 1950 Avery was burnt out. He left the studio on a brief hiatus, with animator Dick Lundy temporarily taking over his unit. He directed a single Droopy, 1952's Caballero Droopy. Though, as it took a year and a half to make a cartoon, and completed cartoons joined a long backlog, Avery had already returned to the studio nearly a year before its release. Avery continued on the Droopies until 1953, when, still struggling from overwork, he left MGM for good. In his decade plus with the studio, he directed a total of 65 cartoons, 16 of which were Droopies. Taking over Avery's unit was his longtime collaborator Michael Lahr, who had co-directed a number of his final MGM cartoons, including Deputy Droopy, released in 1955. Lars' term began with 1956's Millionaire Droopy, a remake of 1949's Wags to Riches, which used Avery's original cells and artwork, though saw new backgrounds crafted in the much wider cinemascope ratio. Oddly, Avery was given sole directing credit on the short, even though he was not directly involved. Concurrently, Fred Quimby retired from MGM Cartoons, with Hannah and Barbera appointed heads of the studio. Under their wing, La would direct a further six Droopies, amongst many other cartoons, even leading the sardonic hero to near Oscar glory, garnering an Academy Award nomination in the Best Short Subject Cartoons category for 1957's One Droopy Night. It lost to Warner's Sylvester and Tweety, Birds and 
Lars Droopy cartoons didn't really deviate from Avery's, keeping their style, tone and formula. Droopy's design even remained somewhat consistent with the later Avery designs, more angular and without jowls. However, with continued cost cutting, characters were now drawn simpler and backgrounds less detailed than ever. The cartoons were also being produced exclusively in Cinemascope, an effort to keep audiences in theatres at a time when the theatrical cartoon was waning. As a result of the larger screen size, inkers also had to be more accurate, resulting in thicker character outlines. On these industry-wide artistic changes, Avery, once again employed by Walter Lance, said he had no qualms with the change, finding that the characters read better on cleaner backgrounds. While recognising the continued quality of Lars Droopy's, Moulton noted, The vastness of Cinemascope did not really suit Little Droopy, and even the best Avery-type gags registered much weaker than they did in earlier, more conventional surroundings. Despite this introduction of Cinemascope, the simplistic animation was noticed by audiences, and numbers kept dwindling. To save the studio, MGM began reissuing old cartoons, which they discovered actually made the same amount of money as new ones. As a result, they figured they no longer needed to produce anymore and closed the cartoon studio in 1957, ultimately bringing an end to the Droopies. While MGM would soon contract Prague-based American animator Gene Deitch and later Warner legend Chuck Jones to continue the Tom and Jerry series, Droopy remained dead for two decades. Jones did have plans to produce a Droopy revival short titled Trooper Droopy, though it never eventuated. He did, however, briefly cameo Droopy in the 1966 Tom and Jerry Matinee Mouse, where he appears on a movie theatre poster advertising fake cartoon, The Sand Pauper. Droopy returned to the screen in 1980 as a cast member of the Tom and Jerry comedy show TV series. With Hanna-Barbera now an animation powerhouse with their own studio pumping out more projects than any other in Hollywood, MGM naturally commissioned their biggest rival, Filmation, to produce the series, which would be home to a slate of brand new cartoons based on classic MGM and Tex Avery characters. Filmation produced 15 Droopy across the series, which again presented him in different times and settings, in some cases even more extravagant than before. The shorts regularly pitted him against the wolf, as well as the Tom and Jerry version of Spike Bulldog to avoid any confusion, and in others he'd ally up with them. Additionally, Droopy had the very important job of hosting the show, introducing cartoons in bookend and linking segments. Due to the sheer number of series they produced, Filmation's cartoons were heavily limited and much more basic in their approach, utilising animation shortcuts and very simple designs. Droopy's design was thus simpler than ever, though he did manage to retain a somewhat classic look. Filmation's Droopies were also nowhere near as zany, fast-paced, humorous or experimental, taking on a stock standard cartoon style with none of Avery's ingenuity. They were also nowhere near as brutal given television standards of the time. All in all, the comedy show was of an incredibly poor quality and was disliked immensely. In his later years, Tex Avery continued to work for various studios, and in 1980 began development of one of his final characters, Quickie Koala, created for Hanna-Barbera. Though Avery passed away during production, the Quickie Koala show premiered in 1981, featuring three cartoon shorts per episode, one of which was headlined by Quickie. Quickie was clearly modelled after Droopy, a smart little critter who could outwit and outplay his rivals effortlessly. However, to differentiate the two, Quickie was peppier, more resourceful and a lot speedier, given a super speed that allowed him to travel from one spot to another in an instant. The series ran for a total of 16 episodes, but as a later Hanna-Barbera and Avery production has gone down as one of their lesser known, more obscure creations. 
Droopy next appeared in Disney's 1988 live-action animated hybrid classic Who Framed Roger Rabbit in a brief cameo. The movie, which throws heavy homage to classic cartoons, sees Droopy in a gag-laden sequence as an elevator operator. Later in the movie, he also appears in a group of characters from various cartoon studios. Droopy also cameoed in each of the three theatrical Roger Rabbit cartoons between 1989 and 1993. In Tummy Trouble, he again appeared as an elevator operator. In Roller Coaster Rabbit, he appeared dressed as a silent movie serial villain. And in Trail Mix Up, he's seen riding a bike underwater. In these appearances, Droopy is seen in his classic Avery design with long jowls and cream muzzle. Between 1990 and 1994, Droopy again appeared alongside Tom and Jerry in the Tom and Jerry Kids Show. Much like the previous comedy show, Kids presented a selection of new cartoons featuring MGM characters, including 65 Droopies. While Kids saw Tom and Jerry aged down into infant form, the supporting characters, including Droopy, retained their adult designs. However, Droopy was given a young son named Dripple, who accompanied him as a sidekick in each of his cartoons. While his jowls were shortened once again, Droopy's cream muzzle returned. Again, each new cartoon saw Droopy in a different job or role, effortlessly thwarting the various schemes of the wolf, now named McWolf, or occasionally competing with him for the affections of Red, now the voluptuous Miss Vavoom. A number of the shorts even saw Droopy and Dripple as 1940s detectives solving oddball cases. Like many other revival series of the 90s, the Droopies regained some of their zaniness and risque nature. Though still nothing on the Avery Toons, they were a step in the right direction. Produced on a higher budget, the cartoons regained some of their polish, detail and quality. The show even managed to boost Droopy's public awareness via a large array of merchandise. In 1992, Droopy, once again with White Muzzle, starred in Droopy's Guide to the Cartoon Network, the first ever program broadcast on the newly launched Warner-owned cable channel. Here he was used to teach audiences about what they could expect from the first 24-hour all-cartoon network. By introducing segments and presenting classic cartoons, Droopy's presence on Cartoon Network remained large throughout the 1990s, appearing in many now iconic promos and bumpers. One saw Droopy in a Pulp Fiction parody alongside Scooby-Doo's Shaggy, while another, bloopers of the cartoon stars, spotlit a faux goof-up from his classic cartoons. Between 1992 and 1998, Droopy even headlined his own weekday block, Down With Droopy D, which featured classic MGM and Warner cartoons. Also in 1992, Droopy cameoed in Tom and Jerry the Movie, ever so briefly appearing in an animal shelter to deliver his trademark line. Hello all you happy people. While only a fleeting appearance, Joe Barbera noted that he had been witness to numerous international audiences screaming and taking the roof off during it. This and his popularity in Tom and Jerry Kids was enough to convince Barbera of Droopy's global appeal and he instantly greenlit a solo TV series. Droopy, Master Detective, debuting in 1993, was a spin-off of the detective shorts in Tom and Jerry Kids. Essentially a continuation, there was very little to distinguish the two from each other, except for fewer appearances by McWolf and Miss Vavoom. Much like the previous Tom and Jerry series, Master Detective presented a collection of new cartoons. Most episodes featured two seven minutes Detective Droopy cartoons for a total of 23 shorts over 13 episodes, with a middle segment starring a rotating roster of Tom and Jerry and Avery characters. Notably, the series saw the return of Screwball Squirrel for the first time in five decades. 30 years on, Detective Droopy remains the last continuous series of Droopy solo shorts. 
However, Droopy did star in Tex Avery's Droopy, a limited comic series published by Dark Horse in 1995, which aimed to return him to his vintage, over-the-top, screwball ways. Much like his classic cartoons, these fantastic madcap comics featured Droopy in numerous settings going up against his regular rogues gallery. Sadly, the series, which was the closest we've ever gotten to Avery's original shorts in style and humour, only lasted three issues. He did however make appearances in the three issue spin-off Tex Avery's Wolf and Red in 1996. In 1999, Cartoon Network starred Droopy in a brand new short, Thanks A Latte. Part of their Cartoon Network Shorties series used to fill in time between programs, the cartoon was produced in flash animation and utilised a typically 90s gross-out style, seeing Droopy as a much older, balding hound. It also introduced new iterations of The Wolf and Red. The short aired intermittently across both Cartoon Network and Boomerang until 2005. In 2000, Droopy appeared in an episode of Harvey Birdman Attorney at Law, Droopy Botox. In the episode, Droopy sues a cosmetic surgeon for giving him too much Botox, leaving him with an uncharacteristically large permanent grin. Aside from this, Droopy was again depicted in a more traditional design. With the adult nature of Harvey Birdman, Droopy was returned somewhat of a contentious edge, but with certainly more crass humour than ever before. In 2002, Droopy appeared in his first and only video game, Droopy's Tennis Open for the Game Boy Advance, which pitted Droopy and foes against each other on the tennis court. A stock standard sports game, it wasn't anything special, receiving mixed reviews upon release. Between 2006 and 2008, Droopy appeared regularly alongside his pals once more in Tom and Jerry Tales, another series which bundled a collection of new Tom and Jerry shorts. Out of 78 new cartoons, Droopy only appeared in four, each in his original design. Given the nature of the program, he didn't get any solo cartoons, instead appearing either as a cameo or as an antagonist to Tom. This was the first Tom and Jerry series for many years that attempted to mimic and recapture the style and tone of the classic cartoons. However, with a huge swing towards children's audiences, they were far less manic or vicious in their violence once more depicting Droopy in an incredibly soft iteration. Since 2002, Droopy has been a regular staple of the Tom and Jerry direct-to-video movies, as per usual appearing in different roles and in varying levels of importance. Some he's a main character, while others he's just a cameo. Some he's an ally, others an enemy. Out of 15 movies, Droopy has currently appeared in 8. In all of these he appears in his traditional design, though personality-wise matches up with the modern interpretation. Between 2014 and 2021, Droopy made a number of appearances in The Tom and Jerry Show. Built in a similar mould to previous Tom and Jerry TV series, it similarly packaged numerous cartoons per episode. Droopy, in his classic design, appeared in nine, usually in cameos again, though taking the occasional prominent role in later episodes. With the series returning to the manic, violent slapstick origins of the original shorts, the show was able to give give Droopy some great visual gags and a slice of what he originally was. Most recently, Droopy appeared in the 2021 theatrical feature Tom and Jerry the Movie. Again, he appeared very briefly and for the first time in CGI animation, though with cell shading. Likely in a throwback to the original Tom and Jerry movie, he's seen in an animal shelter, though this time dressed as Hannibal Lecter. Earlier in the movie, he can also be spotted on a billboard parodying the 2019 DC movie Joker. In late 2022, word dropped that the team at Warner Animation behind the current Looney Tunes cartoon series and the 2021 Tom and Jerry special shorts are currently in development on a series of new droopy cartoons. Only a short clip has made its way online so far and basically no information is currently available. So how long these will be, how many we will get, and if we will get any at all given the current climate at Warner Animation is unknown. Known, but the possibilities for these sure are exciting with such a terrific team on deck.
Droopy is also expected to feature in Tuned Out, a live action animated hybrid series which was announced in 2020 as being in production for HBO Max. Initially planned for a 2021 release, we've heard nothing on it since the release of this quick promo in an HBO Max sizzle reel, meaning it's possibly become another casualty of the Warner Discovery merger. With that, Droopy remains one of the most interesting anomalies in all of animation. His cartoons helped shape the idea of the cartoon that we all think of today, yet he has gone down in history as a footnote, an underrated and underutilised champion that's never truly returned to his original glory. I think in today's climate, there's absolutely a place for Droopy to return to full form and absolutely thrive. And if he does, you know what? I'll be happy. And at that, it's over to you. I want to know what's your favourite Droopy appearance or iteration, and do you want to see him get the comeback he so deserves? Join the conversation down below.